It's officially week seven of Cole's Buckeye Corner, and after last week, I was pretty close on my prediction. Last week against Maryland, I predicted that the Buckeyes would win 38 to 17, just one point off. 37 to 17 was the final score against the Terrapins. Not necessarily fully pretty throughout that game. Started slow, certainly one of the slowest starters of any of the top teams in all of college football, but regardless, the Buckeyes win again. They remain perfect this year. Before we get to this next week, I want to remind everybody that Cole's Buckeye Corner is brought to you by Hinkley Roofing. Make sure you reach out to them before we hit the winter season as the times are changing. Again, if you need anything done to your roof, they're the people to reach out to. The best in the business, as always, I want to give them a shout out. Now, before we talk about the game against Purdue, I want to discuss what has everybody up in arms, and that's that the game will be broadcast on Peacock. The world of streaming has become a bigger and bigger thing over the years, and it's here to stay. People are cutting the cord, people are switching to YouTube TV, Fubo, but then you have all the streaming services as well, Netflix, Hulu, Peacock, uh, you see Amazon Prime as well, where you have shows on there and even they have Thursday night football in the NFL. So the big thing is it's here to stay. And now with that NBC contract with the Big Ten, you're going to see some games on Peacock from time to time, exclusively on Peacock. Of course, bars, restaurants, not thrilled by that. Uh, a lot of fans not thrilled by that either who don't have Peacock. I have to say this. Again, maybe it's not ideal if you're not the biggest into the streaming services, but like I said, the times have changed. Obviously, that's going to be a, a thing, and it's here to stay. I'm not all been out of shape. Obviously, I have Peacock, and I will say this, that Peacock, my opinion, personally love it. To me, it's my favorite of all the streaming services. Of course, I'm a Premier League soccer fan, so all those matches, I get to see all those on Peacock, uh, the ones that are not on USA, and... The other thing is, too, not only are we now getting a little bit of Big Ten and some games on Peacock as well, but uh, some of the other things that they have on there, some of the shows my wife and I like to watch together, uh, happen to be on Peacock as well. So streaming service that I definitely like. I'm not concerned about it, but I do understand why bars and restaurants and other places like that are concerned because they have a ton of TVs. They got to figure out a way how they're going to show games, especially when they're used to, to bringing in a lot of revenue because of Buckeye crowds coming to watch the football game. But let's get to this thing. And I have to say that the linebackers have to improve for Ohio State. Steel Chambers and Tommy Eichenberg. I thought they played well last year. They've had some slow moments here in this year. The tackling could probably improve. The angles that they take could probably improve on the tackles. They're both talented veteran guys. I don't know what's necessarily up. Not grading out that well on some of the grades that you see uh, on PFF as well as some other places out there. So my concern is, can that linebacker core turn it around, right? Why are they struggling so much in really performing out there on the field? And I think those are certainly concerns, but the nice thing is that they're veteran guys. Chambers, Eichenberg, they've played in big games. Again, they know how to step up in big games. Might not be the biggest game against Purdue, but you have one coming up the following week against Penn State, so you have to hit a rhythm and a stride. Cody Simon obviously gets some time out there on the field, but we still haven't seen really anything from C.J. Hicks. They're not putting him out there on the field. He's one of your best couple linebackers. The most talented probably of everybody in that room. He's just not as experienced as those couple other guys. Why has C.J. Hicks not gotten enough time this year? I don't know. Leaves me scratching my head. He's obviously going to be a starter next year as long as he stays and doesn't transfer out because he's frustrated with Ohio State. Hopefully that's not the case because he's going to be an excellent talent. I just want to see him get some opportunities. Now, I gave Kyle McCord some credit in that Notre Dame win. Coming back, a gutsy drive. Could have potentially been picked off once or twice on that final drive. Didn't happen. Okay, it was not per perfect by any means, but still made some gutsy throws, third and long, times when it mattered and you needed it, and he got it done. So I gave him some credit. Am I the biggest Kyle McCord believer? No, everybody knows this on the show who watches and listens. But McCord, again, he was probably the weakest link, I think, 
for that team when they started off against Maryland and started slow. The whole group in general started slow on offense, but the main thing is McCord is your guy controlling that offense. Uh, sure, the run game wasn't as electric without Henderson out there. I get that. But when it comes to having weapons on the outside, he's a ton of wide receivers that he can throw the football to, and he just wasn't finding them. The other thing is some of that pocket composure, the pocket presence. It concerns me a little bit. I know that the offensive line has gone through some of their struggles. There was really a situation where McCord got sacked. Josh Fryer was considered to be beaten around the edge. His guy was trying to do a speed rush around the edge, and Fryer was actually trying to kind of stay in front, push him back, and if McCord stepped up in the pocket, he would have helped out his tackle. He didn't. He kept dropping, kept dropping, kept dropping. The more you drop, the more you hurt your tackles, right? There was nobody in front of McCord. He could have stepped up, stepped in the pocket, stood in there, and if he steps up, that guy blows by him, and the, the, the edge rusher then has to make some sort of a counter move to try to get back and work his way back to the quarterback. So McCord has to be aware of that. When you have time, you don't have pressure in your face, don't keep dropping. You can step up. That's going to help out your tackles. Again, I'd like to see that awareness. He did pick it up later, started finding Marvin Harrison, and then actually put up a good stat, stat line, uh, some of his highest passing yards he's really ever had. So stat-wise, it looks good in the end. But again, there's so many concerns that I have with that pocket awareness and just the delivery on some of the passes and some of the sacks that he takes concerning, especially when you have Penn State around the corner. But as much as I have the concerns there, we look to Purdue, and everybody wonders, is Purdue a threat this year? Because it feels like every single Ohio State coach, going back to like the late 90s and John Cooper, it feels like every single guy loses at Purdue one time in their coaching career with Ohio State. And it happens at, at times where it's like, okay, this Ohio State team is legit. They're really good. They're top three in the country, top four in the country, and Purdue catches them sleeping. Seems like it would be a good opportunity to do so, right? A Buckeyes team that starting slow on the road at Purdue. Penn State lurking around the corner. Could they be looking ahead? Maybe. It's a great opportunity for Purdue. But will Ryan Day lose against Purdue on the road? I don't think so. I think this Ohio State team actually gets the job done. This isn't as talented of a, as talented of a Purdue team as we've seen in some past years. They're two and four. They've had their struggles. And I think Ohio State, even if they start slow, they do win this game. I think the defense steps up. I think they play well overall. And I think they're going to play with some energy at Purdue. And I think Ryan Day is going to have that team prepared saying, hey, this is a place that sometimes we struggle at. We're not going to this time. Focus on them. Don't switch off. That's why I have Ohio State beating Purdue 35-10. to 10. Boilermakers not going to get much done on offense, and their defense is going to spend some time out there on the field. And Ohio State might not put up a ton of points, right? They might have to punt here and there, might be a couple turnovers. But regardless, they're going to get the job done and win in convincing fashion. And then it's full speed ahead of likely Ohio State and Penn State the following week. Undefeated, both of those two teams clashing in the shoe course can't wait for that one next week before we go here in this episode a reminder of my must watch three for this week well Ohio State's game is at noon so these other three ones you can check out on Saturday number one incredible matchup in the Pac-12 best matchup I think all weekend number eight Oregon at number seven Washington that's Saturday at 3 30 mid-afternoon those two West Coast teams going up against each other. Two teams that are on a fast track here to the Big Ten shortly. And they perform very well. Michael Penix, Bo Nix, going to be the quarterbacks facing off. And Penix is probably going to be a guy drafted pretty high in this upcoming NFL draft. But Oregon, they're the ones who have been known to be the better team overall really in the last decade. Can Washington get this win at home? Or will Oregon show up and get the win I'm actually kind of leaning the direction of Oregon, but I think it could be a really fun one. Then my second game, another team that's on their way to the Big Ten, and a team that keeps turning down their invitation to the Big Ten. Number 10 USC and number 21 
Notre Dame. USC going on the road, undefeated, snuck past Arizona. I got to watch overtime in that game, and Arizona gave them a tough test. But USC ultimately got the win. Caleb Williams, certainly a difference maker there at the end, even though Arizona made it close, made it interesting, nearly a big upset there. And Notre Dame went down again. They had just lost to Ohio State. Now they lose to Louisville. And they weren't convincing against Duke. Things are getting rocky there. And you question is, if Notre Dame, a team that they felt like they were in a position to potentially make a run at the college football playoff this year, a second year of quite a few losses for Marcus Freeman and his group, could he end up on the hot seat? Obviously, they probably wouldn't get rid of him mid-season because they have a long season to go and they have a really tough slate with their schedule, but will they give him mercy or will they say, no, your time's done? We will wait and see once we get to the end of the year, but USC could make things interesting on Saturday at 7.30 and things could be going south quickly for the Fighting Irish. And then my third game of the weekend, number 18 UCLA at Oregon State. Love all these games that are happening for the Pac-12. They're towards the end of the Pac-12's existence. And in football, they're making things really fun to watch here in the 2023 season. UCLA, Oregon State should be a really nice cap on the weekend as that game kicks off at 8 o'clock. For myself, Cole McDaniel, thanks everybody for watching and listening to this week's episode. Really excited for week eight, so make sure you tune in next week. We'll see if both the Buckeyes and the Nittany Lions remain undefeated before the clash in the shoe. For the Keon Sports High School Football Game of the Week, Brunswick, they're hosting Solon. Make sure you tune in here later today for that matchup. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button.